Thank you, Adriana, and good evening to you all. Uh, I was honored to be asked to curate this unique program named Conversations on Design, which was the vision and dream of my friend Adriana Friedman. We are going to host here some of the most intriguing and successful and interesting figures in the design world, and it's going to turn this gallery into an education spot. So thank you, Adriana. And I would like to introduce you to our amazing guest. Thank you. Andre Leontali, formerly editor at large at Vogue, is a man who had turned his passion for fashion and his own personal understanding of style and taste into the most global, remarkable career. For decades, his super stylish appearance writings and commentaries have inspired those who aspire to high chic. It all started when Andre developed an interest for the culture of couture and fashion as a young teenager growing up in Durham, North Carolina. He started his career with writing a column on fashion in the RISD newspaper while a graduate student at Brown. There, he wrote a master thesis on the role of Africa in the conception of Orientalism and its influence on French literature of the 19th century. Did I do it right? Yes, you did. When moving to New York at the age of 25, he got the job of his dreams. And this job came to shape his life. He became the volunteer with Diana Vreeland at the Costume Institute at a seminal moment when she worked on the legendary exhibition Romantic and glamorous Hollywood design, which opened in 1974. From her, he learned, tell me if I'm correct, he learned how to look at clothing in a different way, yes. in a more curatorial way, fashion as an expression of culture. Yeah. Under his first paid job in fashion, contributing to the column Small Talk at Andy Warhol's interview magazine, was another ticket to the world of glamour at the circle of Studio 54. He began working at WWD and moved to Paris for the publication two years later. In 1980, you moved back to New York permanently. Yes, right. Last year, under curator at an, ex an exhibition, Oscar de Renta, his legendary world of of style at the Savannah College of Art and Design, celebrating the extraordinary life of late designer and his taste for the timeless. He's now a contributor, editor, and host at Vogue's podcast, and lately began a new career, creating uh, the decor at the Rizzoli New Bookstore. So I'm so honored to host you here in this new program, in this one of the leading galleries of the world at the Lorenzo Gallery. And I want to start with uh, Oscar de Lorenzo. Yes. You were very, very close to him. A very close friend. Uh, Oscar de Lorenzo was not only a great designer, but he was a very close friend in the world of fashion. Um, he was a mentor to me early. And when I first came to New York, he was one of the first designers with his late wife, Francoise de Lorenzo, to invite me to their home to have dinner in his house. And that was a, a, a new beginning for me, and we just seemed to share the same vocabulary, the vocabulary about everything, about beauty, about design, about society, about women, and he, he loved, Oscar loved to talk. He was a great raconteur, a great conversationalist, and he was very cultivated, so he was a very worldly mentor to me. I actually find a lot in common between the two of you. What is that? Which is, I tell you what. Okay. Well, first of all, you were the only males in your families. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. You both have cultivated yourself through reading. Yes. And history, culture, art, fashion. Yes, yes, yes absolutely. Oscar, uh, well, Oscar had a much more, he was luckier than I was when he was young. He got to go to Spain, to Madrid, to study fine arts, and um, he was clever enough to uh, go take a trip on a train. He said he went on a third class because he couldn't afford first class. He went all over Spain 
And when he wasn't studying, he would study. He would study the culture of Spain, the world, the life. So he went on this train all over all the regions of Spain. He went to every state, or city, or region of Spain, Andalusia, Sal Salamanca, everywhere, Cadiz. And he um, loved so much the Spanish life. It so much it permeated everything he did. It influenced everything about his world of design in his youth. And I certainly did not have the possibility to go to Spain, but I did have the possibility to get out of the North Carolina and study at Brown University. My first trip to Europe was very um, important to me. I went on a Euro pass. I went all over Italy. I went to Rome, Florence, and Venice by myself. And I enjoyed those cities. So I educated myself. I'll never forget seeing Peggy Guggenheim's garden. And then out of the garden walked Peggy Guggenheim, going down the street near her house. And things like that really impacted upon me. And um, I just had an extraordinary time learning and seeing Florence and seeing the Uffizi and um, the Michelangelo's David. All of these things were wonderful. And you, you curated a show at the Savannah College of Art and Design in Georgia. And now you plan the, probably the ultimate um, retrospective well, I'm very happy to say I have been in uh, preparation of the retrospective on Oscar de la Renta's career, which opens at the De Young Museum in San Francisco on March the 13th. And uh, the de la Renta family came to Savannah and saw the exhibit that I mounted, which you see here. You see those dresses. The girl sitting is Oprah Winfrey. That's a gown lent by Oprah Winfrey. And uh, so I was lucky enough to have a Mrs. De La Renta and her daughter come down to Savannah, and Anna went to, of course. And they loved what I had done in the exhibit, and so they came home, and about three weeks later, um, the De La Renta family, Mrs. De La Renta, asked me would I curate the show at the De Young. So I've been curating that show since February last, and we uh, got up to, we had about 108 looks. We wanted to show about 130. And these looks have been, um, collected from museums such as the Metropolitan Museum, from Kent State Museum, from the Fashion Institute of Technology, from the President Bush's library, uh, President Reagan's library, Nancy Reagan's first, uh, first lady clothes, and Laura Bush's first lady clothes. I just want to say that part of the amazing world of Oscar is he could dress everyone from Taylor Swift at the age of 25 to First Lady Laura Bush or Nancy Reagan and also Hillary Clinton. He simply had uh, the magic to be able to relate or impact a woman uh, creating dresses and silhouettes and clothes by day, by evening, for women that just made them feel beautiful. But Oscar wasn't out to break the wheel. He wasn't avant-garde. He didn't want to be considered avant-garde. He wanted, he loved designing and he loved it more than anything women telling him, I just love my dress. One of the greatest things was he would see a woman in his dress and saw if she was a very young woman and he would just whisper to her, thank you for wearing my dress. <laughs> and I remember he said that to Anna Winter's daughter, B. Schaffer. And B. Schaffer, as you know, is the daughter of Anna Winter. She has a lot of Oscar de la Renta dresses. And one of the last times he saw her in life before he passed away, he just simply went up to her and said, thank you for wearing my dresses. Wow, wow. And here's another one. This is a great dress. This was a dress he designed for Laura Santo Domingo, uh, who's, who's married to one of the Santo Domingo sons. Laura Santo Domingo grew, grew up in the world of Vogue. She was in Vogue. She worked with Carolyn Herrera. So the Charles James show was at the Met about two years ago, and people were asked to have dresses inspired by the late Charles James, a great American master. And Lauren had this beautiful suit made by Oscar, which was white, and their crinoline bows are made of crinoline, like backing from petticoats, horse, horse hair, not tool, horse hair. They're backed, the things you have for your underpinnings, your underskirts. And the, the dress is very dramatic, and it's, it's, there you go, you know, dressing a young lady, Lauren Santo Domingo, is under 30. I, I want to ask you, when we speak about decor, luxury and yes, style yes. decor, who is your role model? And I want to point somebody, uh, this man. <laughs> photo it's amazing well that's Truma Capote and that's Truma Capote and funny enough you're very very smart 
Daniela, because I actually Thank own that you. very sofa. That sofa is in my living room. I, I bought the sofa at an auction. So I was, I was lucky enough to bid on that sofa and a few other things from Truman Capote. I knew Truman. I met him through Andy Warhol, and um, I also met him at, through Women's Wear Daily, where I interviewed him and the late CZ Guest. And I often saw him in Studio 54. And of course, I had this sofa long after he died. And so that is one of my prized possessions, is that sofa. It is the same fabric on the sofa. The sofa is in perfect condition. It does not have urine stains from cats <laughs> or any of that sort of extra stuff. And I love the sofa. So I learned a lot from Truman. I grew up reading Truman's uh, a, Chris, a Thanksgiving Memory. That was my favorite book to read at Thanksgiving time about his life with his Aunt Souk. And they would make fruit cakes and send them to the presidents and all of that. So he, he very much impacted my life because my grandmother reminded me of his Aunt Souk. So I'm very lucky to have had that sofa. I don't have anything else in the painting. So I, I want to talk a little bit about people you know and about this gallery. The Lorenzo Gallery is now uh, one of the world's leading galleries for Art Deco. Yes. Uh, and uh, Art Deco is the style that uh, was rooted in France in the 20s and 30s. And some of the personalities in the fashion world were the people who really promoted the collecting of Art Deco and collecting of such masterpieces that we can see here in this gallery. And I want to point them to you, some of the people that you've known, some of the people that you were very close to. Um, well, the first one who is probably Yves the Yves ultimate Yves collector yes, yes. of Art Deco. Yves Saint Laurent, uh, I was privileged to be in those drawing rooms in his uh, apartment in Paris where he had the, some of the greatest collections. I just want to say one thing about Yves Saint Laurent that what was really special about him was, first of all, his love for history. And he was very attracted to the luxury aspect of French Art Deco. Yes, he was indeed. He had beautiful objects and beautiful furniture. And he was a master of style, and not only in his designs, but as you can see in his interiors. I think that sale was, it's it got about... It, 2008. About a half a billion, it earned about a half a billion dollars. I, I don't know, but it is still considered the sale of the 21st century. That's, it is considered the sale of the 21st century. Um, he definitely, definitely had a passion for great luxury. Yes, and he really loved Art Deco, and one of the, I think, the seminal pieces in his collection is this chair, which is called the Dragon Chair I by Alan Gray. Gray. Yes, and I think it went for something like 35 million, maybe more. Almost. Oh. 35 million for a chair? 20 million. So the De Lorenzo, uh, Tony De Lorenzo and Adriana Friedman were among the many, many dealers that wanted to buy the chair. Um, but uh, do you know who, who Eileen Gray made this chair for another fashion personality? It could have been for uh, Madeleine Vionnet? No. Paul Poiret? No. No, it was for Madame Lévy, who was a milliner in the 20s, and this was her apartment. Wonderful. And this is where the, um, this um, a dragon chair was made for, so we see that personalities in the fashion world have always been attracted to this style. What do you think? They've always, when they've made a great deal of money in the world of fashion selling dresses, they've always put their investments into great furniture, great paintings. As you can see, Mr. Saint Laurent had Mondrian. He had the Mondrian painting, which inspired the Mondrian dresses. Um, may I speak about Karl Lagerfeld and Art Deco? Sure, please. <laughs> please. <laughs> Mr. Lagerfeld, as you know, uh, he, he, he reinvents himself. He had Art Deco, he had Memphis, he had a great moment in the 18th century. He had the finest, some of the finest examples of 18th century. He had rugs from Versailles and great Ebenezer furniture from signed by the great Ebenezer people who made uh, furniture for Marie Antoinette. But he, when he was in his Art Deco phase, which was in his 70s, he got bored with it and he had a sale. And Michael Chow and Tina Chow bought most of the things in that sale. And then they moved to New York, and you bought some too. Oh, uh, you bought all of it. And then they moved to New York with the Art Deco furniture, and opened Mr. Chow on the East 57th Street, and they opened the doors where Lalique 
They were like it from the Normandy. You see, I know what I'm saying. The doors, yes, the doors to the, the doors restaurant. were Lalik, and they were incredible. And you entered the restaurant, and there were Lalik doors. The walls were white lacquered with about 30 coats of white lacquer. Get, you know, white lacquer. That was a detail that was very important. Go leave everything. Very beautiful. And upstairs, the child's lived with all the art deco furniture. And by the way, Tina Child dressed in haute couture. Tina Child had clothes from Hubert de Givenchy, Dior. Saint Laurent was her favorite, and of course Chanel. And she had closets full of couture that she, you know, just piled around in. She would come downstairs for dinner on a Thursday night in her haute couture clothes, and we would sit there and marvel at them. So that was a great collector of Art Deco. Now, Mr. Lagerfeld got bored, he sold Art Deco. When he went into 18th century, he kept that for a long time. If you've seen photographs of his apartment, he meticulously reinvented the 18th century in his apartment. And I remember my career when I was sent to Paris to Women's Wear Daily. And I, I was frightened to go to Paris for Women's Wear Daily. I was very young. And they just threw me in the, 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 the sea of couture and I just had to swim or sink. And one of the things that I had photographed was Karl Lagerfeld at home. He was very moody then, so he only had dinners by candlelight. It's in the 18th century. Who's, who's laughing? <laughs> well, why is that funny? <laughs> candlelight dinners, but it's in the 18th century. And he wore 18th century Chinese robes at home, or 18th century dressing gowns, the way men in the 18th century wore dressing gowns. And everyone went to his house with these 40s candlelight dinners. And it, it hit page one of Women's Wear Daily. And this was Karl Lagerfeld in the 70s, in his 18th century mode. Then he got out of that and went to Memphis in Monte Carlo in the south of France. Then he sold his Memphis furniture to Helmut Newton because he got bored with that. And he was also very, he's also very elaborate when it comes to gifts. Oh. <laughs> Tell me about the gifts that you You're going to lie. Where have you been reading all this information? You made my homework. Uh, well, I'll tell you some anecdotes. Jerry Hall, has, who's in the news as we know. <laughs> Jerry Hall, he once gave... Um, some extraordinary furniture to Jerry Hall. And he used to give entire suites of furniture to friends to decorate their apartments. But Jerry Hall always said, beware of what Carl gives you because he's gonna ask for it back eventually. So he would always get it back. I mean, they were investment furniture. It's fine, fine pieces of beautiful furniture, he would ask for it back. I think he lent me an 18th century canapé and he did ask for it back after about eight years. <laughs> okay, he didn't forget. So. Um... I would like to speak about another personality that you know that was seminal to the beginning of collecting Art Deco and he also collected a lot in this gallery and this is Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol yes, Andy Warhol was extraordinary, a great catalyst. When Andy Warhol was alive, fashion, society, art, politics merged into one melting pot. It wasn't so isolated. New York now is more isolated and interior private. Society doesn't go downtown to the factory. There is no factory anymore. Politicians don't mix. Uh, you know, you went to the factory and you would meet Margaret Trudeau and you would meet Princess Carolina Monaco and you'd meet a drag queen at the same time for lunch. Um, Andy Warhol's entire factory where we went to work every day was completely decorated in Art Deco. And they had beautiful original posters that were original posters from the 30s, and they decorated the walls. And there were beautiful desks and things from Art Deco. It was amazing. And he started collecting in the 60s when really people didn't know. He was really, in, he pioneered the collecting of Art Deco. And he used to come to the Lorenzo Gallery every Monday. Did you know that? And Lee left. Uh, signed copies of Interview magazine. Wonderful, wonderful. Yes, and so I want to show you a couple of uh, pictures sure. from his home where we can see his collection of art deco. Yes. Have you what? ever visited his home? No, Andy, I never visited his home. He was very private about his home after the uh, assassination attempts. So, you know, very few people who worked at the factory were privileged to go to his house. But I, I, I knew Andy very well. We were very close friends. And uh, this is another uh, example of a photo from his home. So uh, he used to buy a lot in this gallery. Yes. And this is Stephen Greenberg. Yes, yes. Uh, but I want to talk about a designer, a decorator that you love. Yes. She's here with us tonight. Who is she? 
She did this for you. Do you remember? Oh, oh Mika, yes! She's here. Mika, 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 Mika Ertugun. Where is Mika? She's here on the second row. Oh, Mika is right here. Yes, my God, okay. you done Two Mikas are here. You've done your research, dear. So, I'm very impressed with you. <laughs> so Good tell us about it. What is this? Well, there was a magazine called Nest, and Nest was very unique and original. And these two guys, they were a couple, lived in a very small rent-controlled apartment. One was German, and they created the most wonderful interior magazine called Nest. I had uh, gone to the hospital, and they called me, and they had this idea that I should have uh, my room decorated, and they would run the photograph in the magazine called Nest. So I could only think to call Mika, and Mika came over early one morning in her jogging clothes, her exercise clothes, she didn't jog. And she came up with the idea of the whole thing, and you see, I secretly they had this decorated. I mean, we were very gingerly decorating because it, we didn't have permission. So Mika wasn't there when I very gingerly decorated the whole thing. We have a painting over there, you see it came from some gallery. What is that? This is the hospital bed. There's a whole lot of junk around. And I don't know what I'm doing with this ill hat on, it's quite ridiculous. But the, the, the tent, it was like a tent. It was meant to be a tent. And Mika came and she decorated it. By the way, when we decorated that, I, I closed the door to the room and I did, the, the, they hung the, the technicians, the assistants hung up the curtains, hung up the fabric. And the nurses came in and he said, oh my goodness. And they just smiled. They didn't say, who did this? You know, because they didn't say, take this down, because it was unique. And I think I had family who would come over and spend all afternoon. So, how, how do you think that people can acquire taste on the level of, let's say, Yves Saint Laurent or Le Carre Lagerfeld? Is it possible, and how? You, you, you uh, evolve your taste from your childhood. Your childhood makes impressions upon you, whether you are privileged enough to live in a room that's been decorated by a great designer, interior decorator, you, your taste evolves from your impressions of the things you've dreamed about or you desire in your childhood. I can only say that my first impressions uh, were made through Vogue magazine. The pages of Vogue opened up the world to me and I love the world of Vogue. So the world of Deanna Vreeland was a world to me that I knew from A to Z, from cover to cover. And one of the great things that, that I loved is every single page in Vogue just spoke volumes about style. From the men in Vogue to the observations pages, and I could never forget the great, great um, story. It was a story, a big, big story, of Matt too, and it was Mika and her late partner, Chesie Rania, and it was the, one of the most inspiring stories ever. I remember they were dressing, they were like dressing similar. They would wake up and they would wear turbans. They would have the same Gucci saddle bag. So they were like dressing alike. They would look very chic in them. And so the pages of Vogue reflected that, yet they were still very much individuals. And I kept those robes in my house for years. And I tore the pages out and I would pin them up on the walls. You, you say in your book that taste and style has nothing to do with youth or wealth. No, no, no. It has to do with who you are and what you wish to express to the world. And it, it comes from many combinations of many, many things, you know. Mika has a minimalist approach to the way uh, practical things are arranged on a table a notepad and a pencil, and a little, perhaps, a uh, cup of wonderful flowers and enemies. Other people aspire to huge urns from the 18th century with bouquets that look like something in Versailles. And you just, you, you, you reach out to what touches you, which, what matters is what touches you. And what touched me when I was very, very young was that I always, always looked at the world of love. I always, I just did nothing. I, my grandmother, I lived in the house with my grandmother, and she'd allow me to do anything I wanted. And I just sat in my room and just looked at Vogue, and I read Vogue. And I knew who Deanna Rina was, and I knew who Carrie Donovan was, and I know who um, Camille Duhay was, and Keisha Keeble, and she was a young editor. And I knew who you could buy the best maxi coat from the observation pages. And then I discovered Naomi Sims and Pat Cleveland. And Naomi Sims was the ultimate black supermodel of the 70s. She was the first to be on the cover of Life magazine. She was the ultimate, and Halston, of course, the world of Halston was a valuable world. Halston was also a great collector of Andy Warhol paintings. When he died, I think he had about 45, but yet he was minimalist in his interiors because he had gray flannel sofas and low tables with orchids and 
that was it. <laughs> and and you, when you were very young, you also had something to do with this dress. Can you tell us about this? Lana Turner? God, it was my first day at the museum volunteering for Mrs. Reland, and uh, someone gave me a shoebox, and in this box was this dress. It was, un it was not together, it was like in a box, rink, sort of wrinkling around, wrestling, or, you know, crawling around like a snake. And they said, put this together. And I looked at it and I thought, what is this? So someone gave me a pair of pliers and I sort of pinned it together and made it come to life. And Mrs. Ringham walked in and five minutes after she walked through the, d the door at around 2.30 in the afternoon, I was called to her office and, because she was told that I had done that. Who is that? Lana Turner? Yes. From what film? From the film, The po uh, Prodigy. The Prodigy. And she said, okay, who did this? And I went in and I said, I did. And she just said, okay, you're going to stay by my side for the rest of this show. The show was romantic and glamorous Hollywood mm -hmm. design. Mm -hmm. There I am with Madame Vreeland, and Mrs. Vreeland is instructing me. And she taught me how to look at clothes in an exhibit. She taught me everything about clothes. Mrs. Vreeland was an incredible woman, extraordinary capitalist, and, and a wonderful person who just gave you the most confidence about anything. She was very dramatic and theatrical, but she was a very serious, and she was very disciplined in her work. And uh, she taught me narratives about clothes. We are putting together a look of Molina Dietrich from Shanghai Express, designed by Travis Banton. That is not the original, but that is a replica of the dress, I think made by someone she asked to. Maybe Bill Blast, I think that was Bill Blast. How thin am I there? I was like a skinny celery stick. <laughs> so, um, and you had to live up to Mrs. Reeland's Mrs. Reeland, I didn't dare give a suggestion about anything to Mrs. Reeland. I just waited for her to talk. I didn't say, hello, how are you? I just waited for her to speak. And I drank, I drank in every word she said. And she spoke in narratives. She gave you instructions, and she, she the first most important thing I ever did for her, I will never forget, um, she called me into her office, and she was wearing a red dress that day and these very extravagant stockings and these very low, low, low pilgrim shoes by Roger Vivier. And she rose from her desk and she started talking. And it was like reading a, a book or reading pages from a book. And I was given the task to dress Claudia Colbert, Cleopatra, Cecil B. DeMille, 1939 or so, gown by Adrian, tissue lame silk, and uh, she stood, she rose, and she said, um, now, Cleopatra, Cleopatra, and there were pauses and silence. Cleopatra, Cleopatra, you know she's only a teenager. She's a teenager, she's a teenage queen. Mm, and she goes, she makes utterances like she's savoring chocolates or something. And, mm, and then she's looking up into the sky and she says, She's a teenage queen, Andre. You realize she is a queen and she lives in Egypt. And now you must remember she's a teenage queen and she spends all her day in the sun in her courtyard in the palace and having her white peacocks trail around. Now she's a teenage queen. You must remember she's a teenage queen. Now get cracking, which means get to work. And then she sat back down and I went into the gallery and I thought, what the hell is this? But she challenged your mind through the narrative. Of, that narrative gave me inspiration. I looked at the gold on my dress, which was fabulous. I looked at the mannequin, which was not fabulous. I stood there for a moment and I thought, how do I impress Mrs. Freeland with this? And well, I didn't have the answer that day. I had to go back home and I had to think about it a long time. I thought about it overnight, overnight, and I mulled over it. And I thought, gold, peacocks, sun, suntan. She's a queen living in the sun all day long with white peacocks. And I kept thinking, gold, 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 sun, gun, suntan. And <laughs> I thought about Goldfinger. You know the movie Goldfinger? Where this woman has been sprayed in gold and she's poisoned. She's nude. Does anyone remember that film? And she's sprayed and she's sprayed in gold and she dies. That inspired me to have the idea to spray the mannequin gold. Gold on gold, the dress was gold, and the mannequin would be sprayed gold. So I had to go back to the museum and get permission to spray the mannequin gold. I couldn't just make the decision. I said, could I spray the mannequin gold? And they said, yes, we'll give you the paint. And I sprayed, 
I shh, the whole thing was gold, head to toe. Then the gold dress was put on the mannequin with the train and the whole thing. And Mrs. Reelman walked through and she thought it was the second coming. <laughs> And she just loved it. Go and go. So I thought, wow, I really achieved something. So she constantly had me by her side. We were great friends, and I learned so much of her about clothes. She taught me the, the, to look at clothes from the inside out, that the linings were important. This is what is important in a couture dress. It's, it's beautifully made inside as it is outside. And then, you know, some days Mrs. Vreeland would have her lunch, and she'd have a little, little shot glass of doors. Uh, white label, and she called me in. Macaroons! Macaroons! And she starts talking. I think she, was, what is, she wants some macaroons. I'm going to get some cookies for her. Macaroons! I'm dreaming of macaroons. Macaroons. And she doesn't say anything else. <laughs> and I thought, oh, let me go into the store and get some macaroons. And then I thought, no, this is, this is not what this show is about. Macaroons. What? What are we? What? So I went and looked up the word macaroons in a fashion dictionary, and macaroons were the 19th century hairdos of women in England when they had the braids going around and around and around and around and around. And around. <laughs> macaroons, so macaroons, I had to do. I didn't make a fool of myself. And then um, the macaroons had to be arranged because, of course, that was tissue. And I thought, how to get these macaroons to make her impressed? And I remember so well my grandmother, she used to have beautiful hair and it was blue rinsed. But she would buy her hair nets at Woolworths. She'd get three in a pack for 25 cents back in the day. And these hair nets were extraordinary, three for 25 cents. And they were silver, they had silver in them. And uh, Betty Catrou, who was a friend of Yves Saint Laurent, was in New York in the 70s and we had lunch at La Guinée. And she was wearing her fabulous Saint Laurent couture suits with t-shirts and she said, can you walk me down to Woolworths? I've got to buy my t-shirts. I said, what are you doing in Woolworths buying t-shirts? She says, I buy Fruit of the Loom t-shirts and I wear them with the Saint Laurent couture suits, the man tailored suit, and that looks like a look. So we walk down to Woolworths after lunch and we walk into Woolworths and she buys, you know, three, four package for the Loom man t-shirts. And as I walk down the aisle, I see the hair nets. And I say, oh, that's it. I buy the hair nets, I go back to the museum, and I take the macaroons and then put the, swirl them around the mannequin's head and put the hair nets over them. Then I put the hair nets over the faces of the mannequin. And again, Mrs. Freeland was very impressed. She was very impressed. That's a great story. Uh, so here you are with Tim and Chow. Yes. She had amazing taste in fashion, you said it already. But the two of them, Tina and Michael Chow, also had the best collection in this country of French art uh, French art And when they sold the collection... Oh yes, there's the collection in their house. Yes. yes, I was there often, yes. And when they sold the collection, they sold it to this gallery, to the Lorenzo Gallery. Yes. Uh, and some of the pieces uh, now, are still here. Yes. Yes, and this, this one you can see around the corner. Yes. But um, we spoke about collectors of the past, of Art Deco, and one thing about galleries, today design galleries, is that then it's not enough to carry furniture from the past, and they would like to expand the horizon into contemporary furniture. Yes, yes. And that's what the dialogue between the contemporary and the history. And you love history. Yes, I do. And you know what I'm talking Absolutely. about. Absolutely. So I want to show you uh, two amazing designers that were discovered by this gallery. Uh, one of them is living in LA, Claire Grum. Yes. He's making furniture. You're going to see it later because where you're going to sign the books, you're going to sign them on yes. tables by Claire. And he makes furniture out of a tin can tabs. Beautiful. Okay, look at this. Gorgeous. And then, the, and then he displayed his furniture next to lacquer and very like high style Art Deco, and that really what makes this furniture help them to speak. Is that comfortable to sit on? Yes. The, yes, you can actually sit on that. You're gonna try, okay. if you want. All right, okay. And another uh, designer who is here with us to, tonight, uh, Say Memoria. 
he creates furniture. He's here. He also designed the entire space, the interior. He creates furniture out of a uh, crushed malachite. Yes. Look at crushed this. Malachite. Yes. My goodness. Yes. Could you stand up? Where are you? Sam is oh. right here. Where do you get this malachite from? What is the resource? Uh, India. Wonderful. You travel to India to get it? No, I don't. Oh, beautiful. And what is that object? What is that furniture? What do you use it for? This is here. It's a table. Oh, it's a table. Oh, right. yes. Okay. And there is also, so Sam is using many different types of minerals where he crushes them and he glues them together and he makes this uh, extremely inspiring uh, furniture. Ooh. And I would really like to end with one question about Oscar de Laurenta and then I would like to open the stage for yes. questions. Uh, can you tell me, in retrospective, what was his most important contribution to the history of fashion? Yes, I can tell you that his most important contribution to the world of fashion is that he made incredibly beautiful clothes that were not uh, going to change the world of fashion. His ultimate goal was to render the person who wore the dress beautiful. He made the most beautiful dream dresses. Very often people say, oh, this is my dream dress. And he, this dress by Oprah Warren, by Oprah Winfrey, she felt incredible going to the Met Gala. His ultimate contribution was that he was a great romanticist, that he gave luxury to fashion, uh, luxury, and he also was appropriate, and he gave pragmatism in a very elegant way. He made clothes that women wanted to wear, and his clients. And they were very original. And my last question, you call him a great American designer. Yes, he was proud to Why? be American because he was proud to be American. He worked in America. He loved America. He loved this country. He loved the, the, what the country stood for. He loved his life. More than anything, Oscar loved his life. He loved living in his gardens in Kent as well as his gardens in the Dominican Republic. His gardens in Kent are extraordinary. They're like little mini Versailles pockets. You, you walk in his gardens and you think you're in Versailles. And he loved to go out in the garden and he would weed, he and his wife would weed. He also loved luxury, he loved music, he loved opera, he loved literature, he was well read. He had attended all the great balls in Paris in the 50s and the 60s. He was just, a, excuse me, a very lucky man. He followed the flamenco dancers, the bullfighters. He was very inspired by the bullfighters, he was very inspired by the Catholic Church in Spain. The Macarenas, do, is there anyone who the Macarena is? No. What is the Macarena, the great holy saint? You don't know that? In the cathedral in, in, in Madrid? Okay, well, anyway. He was inspired by Spain. All the paintings of Goya, all the paintings of Velasquez are very much inspiration to him. He loved, loved Spain. He loved the culture of Spain. He loved the life and the electricity of Spain. So I would like to open now uh, for a couple of questions. So anybody, questions? Any question from the audience? Yes. Louis? Yes. As you've been in so many um, apartments by, furnished and lived in by so many prominent 20th century interior mm -hmm. designers, um, you've spoken about Saint Laurent, but if you had to pick one, which one do you find the most inspiring or beautiful? Um, I think that uh, it, it's not necessarily a fashion designer. I would think that the uh, apartment of Eric and Beatrice de Rothschild in Paris is a very beautiful place because it's a great place of beautiful collections and beautiful trophies from Hans, as well as beautiful paintings. And it's the only place I know in the world where Andy Warhol paintings are hung in the garage. And the garage is extraordinary. The garage has polished concrete floors and when I went in that garage one day to, to get in the car, I almost fainted because it's a, just Warhol paintings go up and down the wall. I think Eric and Beatrice did a raw child for me. But of course, Carl Lagerfeld. Yeah, I, I don't want to get you in trouble with all of your friends who are designers. But, so what if I were to say dead designers? <laughs> Oh, what did you say, dead designer? Oh, dead designer. Well, that's some dead, what, is that? what dead designer makes well, up? It's, you know, Coco Chanel, it's Yves Saint Laurent. No, I'm inspired by living people, and I, I think that the living people are important. And I, I, I think... <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I think that Oscar, Oscar and his wife have a beautiful apartment in Manhattan. Um, they have a marvelous life in Kent, Connecticut. Um, I think that the apartment of Ann Bass is a great uh, apartment. It was done by Mark Hampton. I think. But not a designer. Well, the, the designers named them. Yves Saint Laurent Carl Lagerfeld. Monsieur Givenchy has a great department. Mm -hmm. Hubert Givenchy, he's still living. I think, what designers do you know? What, what, what designers do we know that have apartments? Bill Blast. Bill Blast. Yes, Bill Blast, sorry. No, 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 no. Oh, yes, Bob, oh, my God, Valentino, oh, my God. <laughs> Valentino is a, the living designer who has the most extraordinary collection. His, his taste is that of the opulent emperors of the past. His house in New York, his, 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 his chateau in France, his boat, his chalet Stad, his apartment in London. One wonders if he is not an emperor. And he has the sum total of extraordinary taste, extraordinary collections of everything. China. I mean, you eat on a plate, uh, Valentino, and it's uh, George, what is it? St. George, the Order of St. George from Russia, from Alain Bey Russie. You eat on a plate like that. Uh, you eat, it, crystal, crystal. The chandeliers are from uh, Meissen, 18th century. Paintings, Francis Bacon, way up there, Francis Bacon, huge Francis Bacons. Uh, just everything is just another world. And he, 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 is, he loves his collections. He is addicted to collecting. And he has very great taste. And he's made something very fabulous clothes. He's one of my favorite, favorite designers. His food is orchestrated to, to match the, the plates. I went to, the, the last time I was in, in the Chateau in Vitville, uh, I was there for the wedding lunch of Kim Kardashian and Kanye West. And the absolute marvel magic of Valentino, the pride he had in hosting this lunch, the food, the way it was presented, the food was served. Something came out for dessert, and it looked like a Venetian bowl, glass bowl. It was spun sugar. It looked like a bowl from the Murano glass factories, and it was spun sugar with sorbet in it. The, 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 the risotto, yet the plates, the chargers, the napkins, the tablecloths, the tablecloths were like ball gowns. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Um, I know you always refer to Mrs. Vreeland as Mrs. Vreeland. Did she ever allow you to call her Diane? I would never call her oh. Diane. And then so I was brought up properly. Are you insane? <laughs> I was only brought up in England. Well, I was brought up properly. Listen, I'm Mrs. Vreeland. I was not calling her Diane. No, Mrs. Vreeland. Until she, the day she died, I called her Mrs. Vreeland. I had that much respect for her. I thought it was proper to call her Mrs. Vreeland. So because did anybody ever call her Diana? That's number one. And number two... Yes, people did. Everyone did. did. Everyone did. I always called her Mrs. Reeland. Oh, okay. And number two was, in your opinion... She was an she, empress, so I had she to... she the greatest of all the Vogue editors, style, She was, Mavens, without question, icons. a great uh, contributor to the world of style in the 60s to 70s. And she continued to contribute to the world of style as she was the curator, special consultant to the Costume Institute. She was not great just because she was a Vogue editor. It wasn't that she was at Vogue because she was great. She was great because she was a woman of sincere humanity. She was a woman who loved life and she loved people. And she made you feel very good about yourself. Andy Warhol also made, gave you the greatest confidence. I mean, I was completely insecure when I came to New York. I was a totally insecure person. Thrown up here in front of the woods of North Carolina. I thought, oh, swim, swim, or sink. But I also did my homework. I read everything, and I, I read, and the reason that I could relate to Mrs. Freeman is because when she said Cleopatra lived in the sun, I knew the history of Cleopatra. She said things, and then I could go back and research them. And it was a very wonderful uh, language that we shared. The same with Oscar de la Renta. And he is a, a man who was inspired by the great writers. He often made clothes that were inspired by the Russians. Uh, Tolstoy, Anna Karenina, uh, was a great influence in him. The Russians, the balls of uh, Anna Karenina, the, the great ball scene, if you read about it, Kant Vronsky. He was also inspired by Marcel Proust. 
and that's a very important thing. He was inspired by great paintings. He would, and so Mrs. Freeland loved life, and I always thought that when I was in the presence of Mrs. Freeland, I was in the presence of God. So you've had some great mentors in your career. I was lucky. And, and it, you have become an icon uh, yourself in the world of fashion and design. Who do you, who, to whom have you passed on? Uh, to whom, who have you mentored and who have you filled with the confidence that you gained from these people? Oh, a few people. I don't, I don't want to name them. Oh, okay. oh but, but they're nice. They're normal people. and a few people. <laughs> I shut up at this point. <laughs> I have to say, yes? Any other interior designers here or fashion designers? Brian McCarthy. Okay. Hello. I have to say, I had the great pleasure of, I was a partner at Parrish Hadley. Ooh, and she was an incredible sister Parrish. Well, and so Mr. Al Hadley, yes. But Albert, one day, Mrs. Breland called, and Albert rang me up, and he said, you have to pick up on the, the phone. And in those days, all you had to do was hit the button, and you'd yes, be yes, in the yes. conference line. And there was Mrs. Breland on the phone asking about Mrs. Astor, Mrs. Whitney, Mrs. De Laurenta. I mean, all he wanted, she wanted to know about the girls. So that leads me, I wanted to ask you the question because you were such, um, such a gateway for her at the end of her life. And God what, bless you for saying that. Well, and, yeah, and, 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 and with great admiration, you know, what was that like for you, you know, really oh. taking on that, that mantle, you know, with her? I want to say I was very, privilege to know Mrs. Freeland. I was extremely, I miss her. I miss her because she was a unique woman. That she, I, I would have done anything for her, often sacrificed uh, to do things for her that I would just, I cannot tell you what a great person she was. I very often would read to her when she was losing her sight. I would go up and read to her for hours and hours and hours. This was one of my greatest joy. I miss that. She would sit on her sofa and listen to me read out loud. I read her the entire book, Queen R Marie of Romania, twice, written by Hannah Pakula, because she loved the story so much. And she, I read uh, Philippe, Philippe Guy de Rothschild's memoirs, which were very rich, very rich details of the grandeur of the Ferrier and all of that. And she loved the spoken word, and she loved listening to my voice. And she said it reminded her of her late husband, because he used to read out loud to her. So people thought, what a weird relationship Deanna Vreeland has with Andre Leon Taylor. What is that all about? It was all about the culture. It was all about history, knowledge, and passion for beautiful things. Of course, we were swinging back the vodka like that. I mean, I was drinking vodka like, oh, you know, like little Fabergé cups. Very chic. You can drink more vodka. I was drinking vodka all night. But I would end up leaving her house at 5 a.m. having red to all night long. I would end up leaving on the weekends. She and I would have dinner alone. I would leave at 5 a.m. And I would sit and read, and then we would have conversations for hours. I remember once we had a conversation for four hours about espadrille. <laughs> the perfect espadrille for my stay. I thought it was fabulous. Super, super fabulous. That sounds and, like my nights with Albert Hadley. Oh, yeah. What did you, what did you discuss? A lot of vodka. <laughs> but in Fabergé cups. No, I had big glasses. Fabergé <laughs> little cups. Mrs. Reeland, and then we were swinging back, and I don't drink vodka today, but I remember I was young, so I could take it then. I was swinging vodka a lot to keep myself up to the enthusiasm, and I tried to live up to her standards. I would go on Christmas Eve, I would go to her apartment, and we'd have dinner, and then I'd get up at 7 o'clock in the morning and catch the plane to go to my grandmother's in North Carolina and go to the Royal Durham Airport. This was my life for a lot of two years when Mrs. Reeland had retired from the world, and I will never forget that. And she, 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 she told people that I read to her, I even read to her in her bedroom, when she stopped leaving the bedroom, I would go sit by her bedside and read, read to her, read everything. I remember once I read an article about Prince, and she listened, and it was in a magazine called The Position, and Prince had just come on the scene. And she said, get him on the blow! I said, get him on the blow, get him over for dinner. I thought it was so wonderful, she thought I would know Prince, and I didn't know him. I was reading an article that I could get him on the phone and get him over for dinner. But she was amazing. Jackie Kennedy also adored Mrs. Reeland. Everybody who ever met Mrs. Reeland thought that she was a great human humanist. She was a woman who gave life to people. She made you feel that you were important. For whatever you believed, whatever you expressed, it was important. I have a regret now. 
I was a seatmate next to you coming back from Paris. It was after Paris Fashion Week. And you were in a hoodie, fast asleep, and I so desperately wanted to talk to you. Oh my god, it was a shock! Thank you. Please, yes. Hi, Andre. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask you what you thought of Mrs. Vreeland at Harper's Bazaar before Mr. Lieberman, Alexander Lieberman, whisked her off to American Vogue, where she began her career, really, at American Harper's Bazaar, where she started the Met. And, and also, twofold, like, what did you think of her, her, uh, her daughter-in-law's uh, movie, The Eye Has to Travel? I think that uh, the career at Bazaar was important, but I, I, I didn't respond or relate to that. I responded to her, her life at Vogue, and it was very important. I, I think that her daughter-in-law did a great job with that uh, video. Granddaughter-in-law, excuse me. She, they did a great job. This is to carry the name on. But what she did at Bazaar wasn't, it wasn't affected by her life at Bazaar. It was her life at Vogue. Everything, Varushka at Vogue, everybody at Vogue came alive. People have careers, thanks to Mrs. Reeland. Oscar owed much to Mrs. Reeland because in those days there was a lot of advertising and Mrs. Reeland put his dresses in the editorial pages of Vogue. She helped to make Bill Blast, Arthur Loretta, Skazi, all those designers owe much to Mrs. Vreeland. Mrs. Vreeland is Dion von Furstenberg. Manolo Blahnik, he went to meet Mrs. Vreeland and he just thought, well, I've, I've done it all. I've met Mrs. Vreeland. You know, Mrs. Vreeland told Manolo that he should design shoes. He took his theatrical portfolio to her for stage design and she says, why don't you try shoes? Now, we would not have Manolo Blahnik today if it weren't for Mrs. Vreeland. Because she thought he had the vision to think he would be a great shoe designer and he is a great shoe master. Yes. Very unique path in your life and also your uh, career. Thank you for it. I wanted to ask you one question. In your vast experience, yes. is there anything that you regret that you didn't do? Or can you think of something that you wished you did and didn't? And also, is there something that you want to do in the future that you haven't done? Mm, that's a very difficult question. Um, the first or the second? Both. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any regrets. Uh, I regret what? Mm. I regret that I didn't spend a, a lot of time in Paris. I lived in Paris twice, and I regret that I did not maintain an apartment in Paris because Paris is extraordinary. You you just you get off the plane and the the light in Paris is wonderful. The way the light hits the walls of the buildings and the history of Paris. Spring in Paris is extraordinary. You walk and see the alleys, the trees. I regret not having a flat in Paris, and I did keep a flat in Paris. I did keep a lot of stuff at the Ritz. I kept it in the basement. And when I went to the Ritz, they would decorate my room just like the hospital room. I was decorated my room with furniture and everything. Paintings, furniture, frame, photographs, everything. Sit upstairs. And um, I had my own sheets, and I had my own bed covers and everything, and pillows, and throw pillows, and rugs, and skunks, and everything. I had skunk rugs. I don't regret much, but I do regret that I don't have a life in Paris. And I would love to just continue to be who I am and to inspire people and to continue to do uh, museum exhibitions. And I'm working on that great exhibition on Oscar de Lorenta, and I think it's wonderful. It's extraordinary. I want to talk. Can I speak some now? Let me speak. Just a few minutes, please. Give me a minute. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, uh, Rizzoli asked me to design the windows. In this shows you can do anything, you know. Charles Myers called me up and he said, do me a favor, go be tattooed you're going to do the first window to Rizzoli. Well, I embarked upon an adventure which was extremely rich and extremely rewarding to me last season. And um, I, the highlights of that were I did the Manolo Blahnik window for his book. I had the most beautiful shoes from his archives. And I had an Obusong rug that I bought from the sale of Bunny Mellon, Rachel Mellon. And I sat at home and I bid on that rug and I had to put the rug and lay away to pay for it. <laughs> but I got the rug and that rug I put in the window and I put the shoes in the rug and blah, blah, blah. I also had to do a window for the launching of the Oscar de Lorenzo book. And one of the greatest dresses or the greatest ensembles, which will be in the De Young exhibit, is of my friend Mika Ertigan. And she gave it to the Oscar archives. I don't know, why'd you give that skirt away? <laughs> It's, it's at the De Young Museum. It's in San Francisco. It's in San Francisco. It's going to San Francisco. So, 
It's, it's in San Francisco. It's going to be an exhibit. So, we, Mika Erdogan once came to me, and we had lunch at the Frank Gehry um, cafeteria of the Old Vogue building. And she said, I want to go to Oscar and have a look made because for my wedding anniversary, my wedding anniversary dinner and dance at the St. Regis Roof. And I want something different because everyone's going to have this big gowns and everything. I want something that's going to be based on a shirt and a skirt. So off we went to Oscar, and he came up with the most extraordinary geranium red ruffled skirt, which was inspired by, obviously, Spain, and a deep, deep sapphire blue shirt. And this was absolutely the sum total of modernity and elegance. And that is one of the most significant things that I remember about Oscar, and their skirt was beautiful. I know Mika thought I wanted to wear it, but it was really an exhibit. <laughs> is, is, is this skirt in the book? No, it's not in the book, but it is in the, the next book in from the De Young exhibit is the in the next, next book. book. Okay. It's in the book, and Mika and I are in the book together dancing at her ball with her skirt. Yeah, I saw and this picture. You saw that picture? Yes, yes. I did. Yes, I did. I Maybe I should have brought it, but I need to ask your permission to please invite you all, all to right, a find a few book. minutes with Andrew Leon Talley in the other side of the gallery. He's going to sign the books. I want to thank you all first for being so attentive and listening. That's very important. And I really appreciate it. I enjoyed being here. And thank you for listening to my little in one minute. anecdotes. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. <laughs> this, is the first, this is the first of the series, right? Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Andre and uh, Daniela. Very informative and uh, charming. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Thank, Thank you. you all. Okay. Have a good evening.